Thank you. You may be seated. Please take your Bibles and turn back to that portion of Scripture that we read just a moment ago over in the book of Exodus. Exodus chapter 10, looking today again, the sixth part at verses 21 through 29. The plague of darkness. We've seen blood, blood frogs, lice, flies, murane, boils, hail, locusts, and now darkness. Blow, flow. Lie, fly, mubo, halo, daddy. Hope you can remember that. It will remind you of all ten of the plagues that we have studied. Now last week, we again focused on darkness and hell and its relationship to the Shekinah glory in our text. Hot smoking darkness is what will characterize hell. Hot smoking darkness is also in the Shekinah at times of judgment. That brought us to the reality of hell. Hell is a real place of darkness, fire, and torment, and it lasts forever. With the plague of darkness, God was warning Pharaoh of what was about to happen to him. Hero was about to enter hell. There are some important things to remember about hell. The devil is not the king of hell. It's the place where he will be punished. Hell is where all unbelievers will spend eternity. Hell is where the rebellious fallen angels, the demons, will spend eternity. Hell is where all the people who take the mark of the beast will spend eternity. Hell is where the beast and the false prophet will spend eternity. Hell is totally dark. Hell is terrifying. Hell is screaming hot. The celebration of darkness is almost upon us again. We are approaching the demonic celebration of so-called Halloween, a contraction of the words hallowed evening. That's a blasphemy as you think of the Lord's Prayer, hallowed be thy name. This evening has been made sacred to Satan for centuries. And since covetousness is idolatry, it is the second biggest economic thrust in the United States today. Let me give you some estimated statistics. National marketing polls by the National Retail Foundation survey have estimated that American consumers will, con will spend $8 billion for Halloween this year. $8 billion. That's more than $85 per person on average. More than 80% of adults plan to give candy to trick-or-treaters. More than 93% of children plan to go trick-or-treating. More than one-third of adults plan to buy costumes for themselves and go to a Halloween party. Hallmark makes more than 300 different Halloween cards. More than 85% of young adults between the ages of 18 and 24 plan to celebrate Halloween. More than 85%. More than 50% of all adults plan to decorate their yards with spooky decorations. More than $1 billion will be spent this year on Halloween decorations alone. Halloween also has connections to Roman Catholicism. In 835 A.D., Pope Gregory IV designated November 1st as All Hallows' Day, making the night of October hallowed evening, or Halloween. But it goes farther than just the economics. Let me read you an article about what happened just this past July. Satanic Temple unveils a massive statue of Baphomet in Detroit. The unveiling of the nine-foot-tall and 1.5-ton statue of Baphomet took place in Detroit and was dubbed the largest satanic event in history. On July 26, the satanic temple unveiled a massive bronze statue of Baphomet sitting on a throne, complete with two children looking up to him in adoration. The unveiling took place in an industrial building near Detroit River after attempts to have it installed near a Ten Commandments monument at the Oklahoma State Capitol had failed. The caduceus on Baphomet's lap is meant to represent an erect phallus. Combined with the two children looking up to him, 
This statue is a true nod to the occult elite's favorite obsessions. The unveiling was preceded by an event which gathered several hundred guests. Before entering the premises, guests were required to sign a contract, quote, selling their soul to the devil, unquote, which was also a way of keeping protesters at bay. Attendees celebrated under red lights cheering, Hail Satan, as bands and DJs performed on a stage beneath a big red inverted cross. Officials of the Satanic Temple delivered speeches alongside a pair of shirtless men who held candles on both sides of the bronze statue. Guests danced and cheered under an inverted cross. Tickets to the event were sold from $25 to $75, and proceeds went to support abortion rights, an important cause championed by the temple. Its official website states, The Satanic Temple, TST, supports personal choice in the context of abortion and as part of a multifaceted women's rights campaign. TST is offering religious exemptions from arbitrary, insulting, and outright harmful anti-abortion legislation that has been steadily encroaching across the nation. And Christians celebrate Halloween. Darkness, that's the celebration of darkness. What is the biblical perspective on darkness and hell? Is it really all that fun that the devil wants you to believe, whereby you can go out and party like crazy, without any inhibitions? That's the statistics that we just read, done by national surveys for businesses, so that they will know how to gear up for this second most important event commercially in the United States. We've seen a few things. Jesus said, if you have no spiritual fruit in your life, it's proof that you're lost and headed for hell. He talked more about hell than about heaven because he doesn't want you to go there, a place of darkness. The Shekinah glory produced darkness for the Egyptians, but it produced light for the Israelites. The Shekinah glory is seen blazing in judgment in the doctrinal epistles of the New Testament. Our hoarded material possessions will be used in fiery judgment against us. The fire of the Shekinah will blaze and consume the earth in the final judgment. The Bible gives Sodomites as specific illustrations of the judgment of darkness of hell fire. The book of Revelation portrays Christ as a judge under the image of flaming fire. We looked at many visible illustrations in the plagues of Revelation that warn the earth that hellfire is coming. Judgment fires in the power of the two witnesses during the Great Tribulation, and we noted before that those two witnesses are probably Moses and Elijah, since they have power over all plagues and cast down fire from heaven as well. We saw the false prophet uses deceitful imitations of God's judging fire to make the world worship the Antichrist. It's not a time of fun and games. The darkness and the death that is celebrated at Halloween is the devil's attempt, and quite successful, at blinding people to the reality of the spiritual war that is going on and of judgment that is, in fact, coming. It is nothing to laugh at. We have to remember that this is a spiritual battle for the hearts and minds of men. Satan can empower the Antichrist and others who live in our midst to perform all the same kinds of miracles performed by Christ and all of the miracle working prophets of both the Old and New Testaments. But the purpose is for deception. Judgment fires and darkness are seen continually through the book of Revelation. God uses darkness to protect believers and shut the mouths of the wicked. God blinds the wicked with darkness so that they cannot harm the righteous. There is no return from the darkness of the grave. And we noted last week that that disproves the spirit mediums who claim that they are contacting the dead but are actually contacting demonic spirits. The darkness of judgment, there is both horrifying physical pain and excruciating mental agony. And then we saw that the Shekinah was darkness at the giving of the law. 
The Shekinah itself, the glory of God, was darkness at the giving of the Mosaic law on Mount Sinai because darkness speaks of curse and judgment and the impossibility of salvation by works. That is why you as a believer do not want to be under the law. We looked at the Ten Commandments in their full context, remember? Remember the end of that passage in Exodus 20? The very last commandment, Thou shalt not covet thy neighbor's house, thou shalt not covet thy neighbor's wife, nor his manservant, nor his maidservant, nor his ox, nor his ass, nor anything that is thy neighbor's. The very next verse, And all the people saw the thunderings, and the lightnings, and the noise of the trumpet, and the mountain smoking. And when the people saw it, they were moved and stood far off. In other words, they were terrified and they ran away. And they said unto Moses, Speak thou with us, and we will hear. But let not God speak with us, lest we die. Moses said unto the people, Fear not, for God is come to prove you that his fear may be before your faces that you sin not. God's design at Sinai was to terrify. To scare them so bad that they would not sin. How quickly they forgot. And the people stood far off. End of verse 21. And Moses drew near unto the thick darkness where God was. You remember the plague of darkness? That's the Shekinah glory with the judgment side facing Egypt and the glory side facing Israel. And the Lord said unto Moses, Thus shalt thou say unto the children of Israel, You have seen that I have talked with you from heaven. That was a thick darkness on Mount Sinai. God says he was talking from heaven. You see, the Shekinah has two sides. The side of brightness and light and joy and peace and love. The side of darkness and flame and heat and torment and hell. At the giving of the law, heaven itself was darkness. We closed last week by remembering that believers are to live righteously, but we are not under the law of Sinai. We saw that nine of the Ten Commandments are restated in the New Testament, but on a different basis. And that new basis is our new relationship to Christ. Our new motivation is love for Christ, not the fearful consequences of the law. There is a new empowerment in the permanently indwelling Holy Spirit. The nine commandments that are restated in the New Testament are enhanced with greater responsibilities. Israel never had some of those responsibilities that it's very clear from the New Testament God expects. But they couldn't have borne that. They couldn't even bear the bare words of the Ten Commandments. But we have greater responsibilities because now we have an empowerment not available to Old Testament believers. We have the permanently indwelling Holy Spirit. And we looked at the examples of murder, which went from thou shalt not kill, to all the way down to where Jesus expounded on it in two full verses in Matthew 5, 21 and 22, ending up saying, Whosoever shall say, Thou fool, shall be in danger of hellfire. Rather serious implications for thou shalt not murder. We saw thou shalt not commit adultery got expanded by Jesus to whoever looks in his heart to lust after a woman has committed adultery with her already. We saw the theft, thou shalt not steal, has far greater obligations and dangers connected to it as well. Let him that stole steal no more, but rather let him labor, working with his hands a thing that is good to ha that he may have to give to him that needeth. And then finally, we closed last week by looking at the law of the Sabbath. That's the only commandment of the ten that is not restated as a requirement for believers today. The law of the Sabbath. The Sabbath was given specifically to national Israel as a sign between God and Israel. We already did a great study on, a great deal of study, I don't know if you thought it was great or not, but we did a lot of study 
on how God still has promises for national Israel. God is not done with national Israel. Most of, well, all of Roman Catholic theology and most of Reformed theology says God is done with Israel. In fact, most of your liberal Reformed churches here in the United States have actually made resolutions at their general assemblies to boycott the state of Israel. But God is not done with national Israel. Let me remind you that those who confuse Israel and the church tend to place believers back under the law, including the law of the Sabbath. And as I mentioned last week, there are many in the reform camp who won't even cook on Sunday, which they claim is the Christian Sabbath, because they would have to light a fire, which was prohibited under the Old Testament Sabbath law, so they eat cold cuts. That's based on Levitic, or excuse me, Exodus 35, 3. Ye shall kindle no fire throughout your habitations upon the Sabbath day. How many of you have ever lighted a fire on Sunday? How many of you have ever lighted a fire on Saturday? Ever done a cookout on Saturday? Be like the Bereans. Search the scriptures. I challenge you. Prove me wrong. The Bible never changes the Sabbath from Saturday to Sunday anywhere. The Sabbath is always the seventh day of the week, never the first day of the week, unless one of the high holy days happens to fall in the Jewish calendar on a Sunday. So have you ever worked on Saturday? Let me remind you where the Bible says that the Sabbath was given only to Israel, not to the other nations. In fact, the Sabbath law was the one thing that God pulled out of the Ten Commandments to emphatically comment on with the death penalty at the end of the giving of the law. You shall keep the Sabbath, therefore, for it is holy unto you. Everyone that defileth it shall surely be put to death. For whosoever doeth any work therein, that soul shall be cut off from among his people. Have you ever worked on Saturday? If you're under the law, you must die. Six days may work be done, but in the seventh is a Sabbath of rest, holy to the Lord. Whosoever doeth any work in the Sabbath day, he shall surely be put to death. That's Sabbath law, folks. Exodus 31, 16. Wherefore the children of Israel shall keep the Sabbath to observe the Sabbath through their generations for a perpetual covenant. It's the children of Israel who have this as a perpetual covenant. Verse 17. It is a sign between me and the children of Israel forever. For in six days the Lord made heaven and earth, and on the seventh day he rested and was refreshed. And he gave unto Moses when he had made an end of communing with him upon Mount Sinai two tables of testimony, tablets of stone written with the finger of God. The Sabbath was the one thing that God pulled out to make emphatic comment related to the death penalty before he handed the two tables of the law to Moses. It's emphasized again that relationship of the Sabbath to national Israel in Leviticus and Numbers. Every Sabbath he shall set it in order before the Lord continually, being taken from the children of Israel by an everlasting covenant. Numbers 15.32 and while the children of Israel were in the wilderness, they found a man that gathered sticks upon the Sabbath day. They put him in hold, and God said, kill him. Remember, just gathering sticks, picking up sticks, picking up sticks. He hadn't lit a fire, but he picked up some sticks. Ever walked home on a Saturday or even on a Sunday? And here's a, in the fall, we have it all over the place right now tree branch or little tiny twig on your walkway and you reached down and picked it up and threw it off in the grass. You picked up sticks on the Sabbath? I don't care which day you want to choose, Saturday or Sunday. I bet every one of us here has done that at least once. And they killed him! Do you want to be under the Sabbath law? Remember, you cannot take part of the Sabbath law and ignore the rest. The New Testament says so. James 2.10 For whosoever shall keep the whole law and yet offend in one point, he is guilty of all. Remember? God pronounced the death penalty for breaking the Sabbath. If we're under Sabbath law, there is a death penalty for breaking the Sabbath. If you have ever worked on Saturday... You must die. 
Are you getting the point? You shall keep the Sabbath, therefore, for it is holy unto you. Everyone that defileth it shall surely be put to death. For whosoever doeth any work therein, that soul shall be cut off from among his people. Six days shall work be done, but on the seventh day there shall be unto you an holy day, a Sabbath of rest to the Lord. Whosoever doeth work therein shall be put to death. Now, I want to answer a question that we didn't have time to cover last week. I hope you picked up on it as I read these passages just a moment ago. What about the connection of the Sabbath to the days of creation? Doesn't that mean that we should keep the Sabbath since creation was obviously before the giving of the law? And God established some transdispensational principles that go all the way back to the beginning, like marriage, one man and one woman, not one man and 14 women, or one man and one man and one woman and one woman, or multiple men and multiple women sort of mingling together in group marriages. All that's on the table, folks, and it's a man and a woman, not a human being and an animal. There's perversion out there, and it's being pushed to try to get it into law now. So you say, okay, well, but, but creation, that's, that's all the way back to the beginning, so maybe that's why we should do it. Exodus 31, 17, it's a sign between me and the children of Israel forever. For in six days the Lord made heaven and earth, and on the seventh day he rested and was refreshed. So what about that argument? Well, there are several things that we need to remember as we seriously consider the question. Number one, look at the verse itself and what else it says. Look at the verse in its context and what else it says. Number one, the first thing to note in that verse is that creation, God rested on the seventh day. Not the first day or the eighth day. God rested on the seventh day. Creation establishes the seventh day as the day God rested. So if you want to use creation as your model, you are still stuck with a seventh day Sabbath. You want to use creation? You're stuck with a seventh day Sabbath. And so you have seventh day Adventists, you have seventh day Baptists, you have many other types, types of Sabbatarianism, many different groups that practice a seventh day Sabbath based on that reference to creation. You're stuck with it because God did not rest on the first day and God did not rest on the eighth day. He rested on the seventh day. The second thing to notice as you look at that verse that I just read to you out of Exodus 31, 17, it was God who rested, not man, on the creation Sabbath. Third, the reference to creation, if you look at the context here, is to give a visible clearly understood word picture, clear to the Hebrew mind, of what God meant when he told them not to do any work on the Sabbath. He said, if you don't get it by what I said, look at what I did. What did I do on day seven of creation? Hmm. Let's see, did, did he create um, the sun and moon? No, no, no. Did, did, he, did he create the animals? Uh, did he create the birds? Did he create the fish? Uh, did he create the plants? How about the trees? Did he create man? Did he create Eve? Hmm. What did he create on the Sabbath? What did he do? Zip. Zilch. Nothing. You see, we as people, and as you look at the Old Testament, the Jewish people in particular, were always looking for ways around the law. There's got to be a loophole here somewhere. And so to make sure that people kept the law, the, the rabbis developed 613 things that they called the hedge about the law. So that they added stuff to the law to make sure that you wouldn't actually get down to where you were breaking the law itself. But it was God who rested on the Sabbath, not man. And God was simply using that to show them what he meant 
when he said, don't work on Saturday. There were no exceptions. Number four, the specific reference in Exodus 31, 17, where the Sabbath is connected creation, clearly states that it relates, quote, to a sign between God and the children of Israel forever. That's in the same verse, the same context. It relates to the children of Israel. God said, I'm giving this to you, and since you are the ones who have the true narrative of creation, not all those things that the pagans have come up with, and if you look at ancient world history, you discover that all the nations have a perverted view of creation. They've managed to maintain a few little trinkets of part of the story here, but then they've added all kinds of other stuff, too. Same way with the worldwide flood. Every culture around the world has a memory of the flood, but it has been perverted over the years. Only Israel has the true narrative in the Old Testament scriptures. Here in that context, it clearly states that it relates, quote, as a sign between me, that is God, and the children of Israel forever. The children of Israel, not the church. Number five. Now listen to this carefully, folks. You want to be under Sabbath law? Don't just look at that negative stuff about thou shalt not do stuff on the Sabbath. I don't care whether you want to hold Sunday or Saturday as a Sabbath. There's another thing in that verse that we just read, Exodus 13, 17. That every one of you who have ever been an adult who worked have broken. Did you know what Sabbath law required? Sabbath law required six days of labor every day week, not five. Six. All of you adults all have broken the Sabbath law because for most of your adult working lives you have only worked five days per week, not six. If you're going to claim creation as your support for practicing Sabbatarianism, start working six days per week. Number six. The New Testament epistles establish the first day of the week as a day of worship and giving. Not a day of rest, but of worship and of giving based on the resurrection of Christ. It's not a day of rest based on either the Sabbath or the law. If you look at all the passages in the New Testament where the Christians are together, it's the first day of the week. And it's for worship and and forgiving. For example, 1 Corinthians chapter 16, verse 2. Upon the first day of the week, let every one of you lay by him in store, as God hath prospered him, that there be no gatherings when I come. Number seven. The apostles went to the synagogues to preach to Jews on what is clearly called in the New Testament the Sabbath, the seventh day of the week. There were not two simultaneous Sabbaths going on in the New Testament. One for Jews and one for Christians. The Jews met on the Sabbath. The Christians met on Sunday to celebrate the resurrection of Christ. The Sabbath celebrates the giving of the law. The Sabbath celebrates a curse with a death penalty. The first day of the week celebrates life and not death. It celebrates grace and not law. The apostles went to the synagogues to preach to Jews on what is clearly called in the New Testament the Sabbath. Christians celebrate the resurrection of Christ. So how does this sidetrack to the Sabbath have anything to do with our text? Two things. Number one, the darkness at the giving of the law. And two, the Sabbath was a reminder of the exodus from Egypt. Deuteronomy 5 says so. And remember. It's a point of remembrance. Remember that thou wast a servant in the land of Egypt, and that the Lord thy God brought thee out thence through a mighty hand, and by a stretched out arm. Therefore the Lord thy God commanded thee to keep the Sabbath day. 
it's so that the Jews will remember the Egyptian bondage and their deliverance. The darkness at Sinai was number one, a point of reference, and number two, a memory warning for Israel when they were tempted to sin. The point of reference and the warning memory took them back to the plague of darkness. Only take heed to thyself and keep thy soul diligently. This is Deuteronomy 4. Lest thou forget the things which thine eyes have seen, and lest they depart from thy heart all the days of thy life, but teach them to thy sons and thy sons' sons. What did God want them especially to remember? To teach their children and their grandchildren? Very next verse. Especially the day that thou stoodest before the Lord thy God in Horeb. Horeb is Mount Sinai. When the Lord said unto me, Gather me the people together, and I will make them to hear my words that they may learn to fear me all the days that they shall live upon the earth, and that they may teach their children. And ye came near and stood under the mountain, and the mountain burned with fire under the midst of heaven, with darkness and clouds and thick darkness. That's what God wanted them to remember. The Jews, the giving of the law at Mount Sinai, and specifically to remember the thick darkness. And the Lord spake unto you out of the midst of the fire. And ye heard the voice of the words, but saw no similitude, only ye heard a voice. And he declared unto you his covenant, which he commanded you to perform, even ten commandments. And he wrote them upon the two tables of stone. Moses reminded Israel again of the smoking Shekinah in chapter 5. These words the Lord spake unto all your assembly in the mount out of the midst of the fire of the cloud and of the thick darkness with a great voice and he added no more and he wrote them on two tables of stone and delivered them unto me. It's a point of remembrance. It's a point of reference. It's a point of warning memory to Israel of judgment. Verse 23, it came to pass when you heard the voice out of the midst of the darkness, for the mountain did burn with fire, that you came near unto me, even all the heads of your tribes and your elders. Joshua reminded the people that it was an impenetrable darkness of the Shekinah that protected Israel when they crossed the Red Seas. The Egyptians could not get through it to get to the Israelites. Here were the Israelites fleeing for their lives and the walls of water on both sides of them and the Shekinah glory behind them, and behind that Pharaoh and his chariots who could certainly outrun these walking Israelites, and they couldn't get through the darkness to get to Israel. Joshua reminds the people that it was an impenetrable darkness of the Shekinah that protected Israel when they crossed the Red Sea. Joshua 24, 7. And when they cried unto the Lord, He put darkness between you and the Egyptians and brought the sea upon them and covered them. And your eyes have seen what I have done in Egypt. And ye dwelt in the wilderness a long season. God wanted them to especially remember. Oh, yes, He wanted to remember all the other plagues. But He wanted them to remember the darkness. Because that's judgment. And that's what they saw at Mount Sinai. And if they had understood that the law was designed to drive them to Christ, not to be a means of salvation. When God brings the darkness of the Shekinah, it is for judgment. Second Samuel 22, 10 and 12, He bowed the heavens also and came down, and darkness was under His feet. And He made darkness pavilions round about Him, dark waters and thick clouds of the skies. Darkness shrouds the invisible God so that we will not see him and die. First Kings 8.12 And then spake Solomon the Lord's son unto me that he would dwell in the thick darkness. It's quoted again in Second Chronicles 6.1 Then said Solomon the Lord has said that he would dwell in the thick darkness. Darkness was part of the curses of the law on Mount Ebal and at Mount Gerizim for failure to abide by the covenant of the law. The blessings were pronounced by over a million people on Mount Gerizim. The curses were pronounced by over a million people on Mount Ebal. They shouted them all together. And Deuteronomy 28, 29 gives us one of the curses from Mount Ebal. And thou shalt grope at noonday as the blind gropeth in darkness, and thou shalt not prosper in thy ways, and thou shalt only be oppressed and spoiled evermore, and no man shall save thee. 
The darkness is a reminder of what's coming, of the curse of God. And that's why it makes it so poignant when we look at Calvary. The thick darkness of the Shekinah was seen at Calvary. It was seen for three hours, like the three days in the tomb, like the three days of darkness in Egypt. This was the darkness of judgment of the sin laid on Christ. My sin! My sin! And yours. And all three of the synoptic gospels tell us this. Mark 27, 45. Now from the sixth hour there was darkness over all the land unto the ninth hour. Mark 15, 33. And when the sixth hour was come, there was darkness over the whole land until the ninth hour. Luke 23, 44. And it was about the sixth hour. And there was darkness over all the earth unto the ninth hour. Jesus, the infinite God-man, was bearing the wrath of the dark side of the Shekinah as he hung on Calvary's cross for you and for me. Oh, I hope that makes you weep. As at creation, like at the moment of salvation, Jesus brought light out of darkness. In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth, and the earth was without form and void, and darkness was upon the face of the deep. And the Spirit of God moved upon the face of the waters, and God said, Let there be light, and there was light. John 1. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God. Jesus was at creation. And the Word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. All things were made by Him. And without Him was not anything made that was made. That's Genesis 1 it's talking about. And what is the very first word that God speaks? Let there be light. And what does it say in the very next verse in John? In Him was life, and the life was the light of men. And the light shineth in darkness. And the darkness comprehended it not. In hell throughout all of eternity, it will always be darkness. In heaven throughout all of eternity, there will never be any darkness. There will not be time as we know it in heaven because there will be nothing to mark the passage of time. No sun, no moon. Time shall be no more. All, quote, 24 hours of the day there will be light. There will no be unprofitable downtime in sleep. There will be done away with sleep. And we will never be tired. To encourage us, God says it twice. Revelation 21, 25. And the gates of it shall not be shut at all by day, for there shall be no night there. Revelation 22, 5. And there shall be no night there, and they have no need of candle, neither light of the sun. For the Lord God giveth them light, and they shall reign forever and ever. Let me give you the beautiful context of those verses in contrast to the darkness and the burning of hell. I love this passage. Revelation 21, beginning in verse 10. And he carried me away in the spirit to a great and high mountain and showed me that great city, the holy Jerusalem, descending out of heaven from God, having the glory of God, that's the Shekinah, and her light was like unto a stone most precious, even like a jasper stone, clear as crystal, and had a wall high and great and had twelve gates and at the gates, twelve angels and names written thereon, which are the names of the twelve tribes of the children of Israel. On the east, three gates. On the north, three gates. On the south, three gates. And on the west, three gates. And the wall of the city had twelve foundations, and in them the names of the twelve apostles of the Lamb. 
And he that talked with me had a golden reed to measure the city, and the gates thereof, and the wall thereof. And the city lieth four square, and the length is as large as the breadth. And he measured the city with the reed, twelve thousand furlongs, the length and the breadth and the height of it are equal. And he measured the wall thereof, and hundred and forty-four cubits, according to the measure of a man, that is, of the angel. The building of the wall of it was of jasper. And the city was pure gold, like unto clear glass. And the foundations of the wall of the city were garnished with all manner of precious stones. The first foundation was jasper, the second sapphire, the third a chalcedony, the fourth an emerald, the fifth a sardonx, the sixth sardius, the seventh chrysolite, the eighth beryl, the ninth a topaz, the tenth a chrysophorus, the eleventh a jacinth, the twelfth an amethyst. And twelve gates were twelve pearls. Every several gate was of one pearl. And the street of the city was pure gold, as it were, transparent glass. And I saw no temple therein, for the Lord God Almighty and the Lamb are the temple of it. And the city had no need of the sun, neither of the moon to shine in it, for the glory of God did lighten it, and the Lamb is the light thereof. Jesus is the light of the world. Jesus is the light of the Shekinah. Jesus is the light that gave light to Israel on that night long ago and darkness that could be felt to the Egyptians. And the nations of them that are saved shall walk in the light of it. And the kings of the earth to bring their glory and honor into it. And the gates of it shall not be shut at all by day, for there shall be no night there. And they shall bring the glory and honor of the nations into it. And there shall in no wise enter into it anything that defileth neither whatsoever worketh abomination or maketh a lie, but they which are written in the Lamb's book of life. In chapter 22, And he showed me a pure river of water of life, clear as crystal, proceeding out of the throne of God and of the Lamb. In the midst of the street of it and on either side of the river there was the tree of life, which bare twelve manner of fruits and yielded her fruit every month. And the leaves of the tree are for the healing of the nations. And there shall be no more curse. But the throne of God and of the Lamb shall be in it, and his servants shall serve him. Oh, I'm looking forward to that. And they shall see his face. And his name shall be in their foreheads. And there shall be no night there. And they need no candle, neither light of the sun. For the Lord God giveth them light. And they shall reign forever and ever. Are you looking forward to it? I hope you are. Or are you looking forward to darkness and fire and pain and terrifying agony through all of eternity? Are you ready? Do you know for sure you're ready? You all know that a few weeks ago, I was in Alabama for the installation of Judy's gravestone. And once again, I was reminded of the shortness of time before we stand before Christ to give an account and have our lives tested by the fire of the Shekinah. The unbeliever will be cast into fire and to darkness for eternity. The believer will either have his works burned up or will receive heavenly rewards that last forever and enter into the glory of which we've just read. Are you ready? Do you know for sure that if this was your last breath, Jesus would take your hand and some say, come see the place that I've just finished preparing for you. Gracious Heavenly Father, 
how we thank you for the great and precious promises of Scripture. You've given fair warning to all those who do not know Christ of what it will be like. You showed Israel what it would be like. You showed Pharaoh and made him experience what it would be like. Oh, Father, darkness for one, light for the other. Heaven as darkness in judgment, heaven as light in life and joy and peace in the river of life, the tree of life and the city of life and the beauty of life and eternity filled with life with no darkness, no night, and they don't need the sun because the Lamb is the light of the city. Thank you, Father. We don't deserve it, but we love you and we thank you. In Jesus' name, amen.